So, hey everyone, thanks for joining this DAO panel. Uh, I'm really excited to, to have this discussion. By way of just a brief background on myself, uh, I am a second year MBA student. I am the head of governance for the, the Blockchain Club. Before business school, I did operational design at Goldman Sachs and then did organizational design, left, joined an HR tech startup. Um, and then this past summer, I was at a VC firm called the Churning Group, and they had me do a, a 10 week deep dive on on DAOs uh, and given my organizational design and org psych background i haven't been able to uh lift my head and, and get out of it i'm just there's so much to uncover so i'm particularly excited about this discussion um we have a, a great group of panelists to so just to get us started um if we could just kind of go around if you could give background on yourself um when and why you started getting involved in DAOs, and then a little bit of background on your organization um so we can kick off with uh julia awesome thanks for organizing this time we really appreciate it um so i am julia i'm the co-founder and chiefess of orca protocol we're building uh DAO infrastructure and the key primitive that we're building is what we call pods uh, pods are small working groups to build governance around people based on their expertise rather than just their token learning. So um, we're very excited to see how we can empower a new wave of contributors in DAOs um, and empower them and give them more autonomy um, with the sort of responsibilities and uh, access that they have within DAO ecosystems. Um, so I'm sure we'll cover lots more on that, but that's me, and that's what I'm working on. Yeah, ton, ton to dive into there for sure. Um, let's jump to Derek and then Scott and then Connor, just so that you guys know the rough order. Thanks, Tony, for, for having us. Uh, I previously was a crypto, I worked at a crypto fund called Blockchain Capital, spent about two years there, um, invested in and looked at a bunch of DAOs saw firsthand the, the challenges and the, and the roadblocks that they faced as they launched their governance process, launched a token. So I left VC and I started a company called Reverie with my co-founder, Larry. And Reverie is basically a professional like protocol politician and independent board members for protocol DAOs. So protocol DAOs, these include like Compound, Uniswap, UIDX, um, sort of have these large treasuries that they're tr in trying to figure out how to spend, how to deploy, um, and sort of how to scale these organizations and, and hire full-time people for, for the team, um, but specifically uh, through governance. So Reverie and I help figure out how to do that. We set up working groups, we run grants programs, we set up treasury management programs and, and growth initiatives. Um, and yeah, currently met, working with a, a few different DAOs including the ones that I, I mentioned. Perfect. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Scott. I work on Bitcoin primarily, although I think as you'll maybe notice from a lot of folks here, like everyone in Web3 is involved in a bunch of different projects um, in some capacity. Uh, I got started in DAOs in actually 2016 when I started this kind of founder equity exchange project, which didn't really go that far. The DAO hack happened unrelated. Um, if you haven't looked at that history, it's actually super interesting. There's a great Bloomberg kind of like uh, story about the whole um, event. And then in 2017, 2018, I started Bitcoin with Kevin just around trying to grow and sustain digital public goods. Um, we've since expanded that mission just to think about like generally how we're thinking about coordination problems like beyond traditional institutions. So. You know, if you look at like the last 200 years, you've got like the nation state, you've got like corporations, those aren't like bad models, like, but we kind of just assume that like, that's it, like that's how we coordinate. And I think that's like a really big sort of problem that um, Web3 and then, you know, with our work in particular, we're trying to get people to think about. So really excited to be here and I will pass it to Connor. Hey everyone, thanks Tony for organizing them. Um, so I'm formerly a lawyer. I started a crypto practice in my law firm like four years ago, a big full service firm in Toronto, left quickly after that to start working with crypto projects, because you'll see with most crypto lawyers, they try to immediately leave their firms as quickly as possible because it's so much more interesting to work at a crypto company. 
And while working for a bunch of crypto companies appreciated, okay, we have a lot of money to pay lawyers, but the lawyers have no idea how we can do anything in a compliant way. So got together with Polychain and Protocol Labs and DCG and Coinbase at the time and started the Blockchain Association. And so I've been working a lot on the advocacy side in crypto and then in venture. And now um, do a variety of different things focused around advocacy and policy, but also uh, run the DAO Research Collective, which is an organization that essentially does collective R&D for DAOs. We procure an open source information and research that we think is going to be foundational to faster growth and development of DAOs. Um, we're funded by Ethereum Foundation and Uniswap and Compound and Abe Grants, uh, a lot of great groups. And if you are looking to do research on governance, on treasury management, on legal, and any of the things we're probably going to discuss today, just hit me up. I would be really interested to hear um, what you're working on. Yeah, thanks, Connor. And thanks, thanks everyone for that background. Uh, shameless plug, I I'll just uh, give Connor some quick kudos. Uh, I connected with him after doing that 10 week sort of deep dive. Um, and he's been a great thought partner and really gracious with his time. Um, so I really appreciate that. And he's a great person to, to reach out to. Um, cool. So just to give a rough roadmap of the discussion for everyone, um, we're going to spend I don't know, roughly 15, 20 minutes on the current landscape of DAO. So we'll talk about tooling, we'll talk about grants, we'll talk about some coordination um, challenges and how some best practices to overcome them. Um, something that you know Scott had referenced, but I think uh, maybe a fun place to, to, to start um, is what excites you the most about like what is currently achievable with DAOs, right? Less so the promise um, of what DAOs can be, but like today, actually, um, what it enables. And I'll start with uh, Scott. So I, I don't have a strong opinion on this particular first take I'll give uh, because it's it's a weird, controversial one. But like in the last five days, seven days, a whole bunch of people got together to try and buy a copy of the Constitution. And I thought that was like kind of an interesting just example of the fact that like regardless of like, you know, the diving into the details of it, that none of these people really knew each other very deeply. They didn't have like a really great immediate way to like coordinate funds. They really didn't have like a clear strategy or plan to like what they were trying to do. But in like a span of a week, they managed to get like about 30, $40 million together. They managed to get about like 20 people to be core contributors to this project. And they managed to do that pretty much with like a group chat, AKA Discord and a multi-sig, which they use this thing, Juicebox, for. And to me, that's like the immediate, like tangible promise of DAOs, which is like, if you wanted to do any of those kinds of transactions or like any of that work before, you'd probably have to go through like five or six like different types of institutions on like all these different sides of the transaction. And that's fine, I guess, but like good luck doing that in a week with like business hours and like all the normal sort of like things there. So I think the promise immediately of DAOs and today is just like extremely quick coordination of capital in a way that like we now take for granted with the way that we transfer information. So the 1960s, you'd never like send mail to someone to like ask them to go to lunch, but now you'll like text someone and just say like, hey, like, are you, are you free? I think we'll start to see capital and like the coordination of capital in a similar way in the next 20 years. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I don't want to put anyone on the spot. Does any, anyone else have sort of a burning thought of what they're they're excited about? Yeah, I would just add that, yeah, I think Scott brought up a great point, like coordination to do cool um, and interesting things that weren't previously possible is sort of the whole point of DAOs. And that's sort of like a vague sort of statement. It's like, and to many people, DAOs, it's like, it's such a conflated term at this point that there's not as much clarity. But I think the, the simplest way to think about it is to look at subreddits. Um, there's subreddits on Reddit for lots of different communities, lots of different interests, ranging from like hundreds of people to, to millions. Um, and they're all coordinating around some specific interest. It could be like a sports team, it could be a hobby, it could be um, a geography. And sort of adding a crypto element to that is just adding in a, an easy financial layer for them to coordinate around something. So I think it's just adding a simple concept of financial tooling and, and primitives to online 
digital communities, which means that, and, and yeah, the, the areas that can affect, I mean, it's, it's, it's endless. I think also to tag on to what Derek and Scott said, which I completely agree with, is that um, I think what's really powerful about DAS Day is your ability to affect change very quickly. Um, when we look at the traditional world and traditional companies, your sort of access to information and to people and contributing is obviously extremely closed. Um, and that's like a really powerful part of DAOs is that we're building these fluid open ecosystems. And um, if you're motivated enough and excited enough about a project, like there is usually a path forward for um, participating and affecting the change that you want to see. Um, I think obviously there's a lot of room to grow with that in terms of uh, tools and mechanisms we use uh, for contributors to actually get to that point. Um, but I do think, you know, if you're loud enough in the Discord, you show up, you maybe write a proposal, you get a grant. There are a number of ways that uh, you can affect change very quickly. Yeah, and, and if, I'm sorry, go ahead, Connor. No, I was going to say lots of really good questions coming in the chat too. But um, I can't, taking it from the perspective of the, of the sort of like quasi legal guy, I used to be a lawyer. No longer I'm a lawyer, but so no legal advice. Uh, but um, in reflecting on like the question and what you can do today, I think Constitution DAO is amazing because it's drawn a lot of attention to the structure and how quickly these like I think they're they were called like at least in the Twitter, um, whatever Twitter news thing they were called Internet Friends. A group of Internet Friends got together to buy the Constitution, and it's just such a great. Uh, you know, it's so funny to think of uh, the power that these internet friends have had in, in, I think they've raised $20 million or something over five or six days to buy this, this edition of the constitution. So that's very incredible. Um, and they're really pushing the envelope with this model uh, and being really public with this model. And this model is maybe, and some people have flagged this, certainly the legal clarity around it is it's not totally clear. And that's a lot of crypto. It's like relatively gray, but I think that crypto has made many more people aware of um, the power of like coordination and even even coordination at a more uh, like at a more elementary compliant level you could do something really amazing with a DAO that is clearly compliant like flamingo DAO or like you know they might have to be smaller they might have to include a smaller group of people but using tools in crypto you can do something that's completely onside the law if you want, things that have never been unearthed before, or you could do something that is way more interesting like Constitution DAO and any number of things we're gonna see in, in the short term. But for those who are like who are reticent about that part of it, there is also um, a ton of things that the DAO structure enables that could be done today in, in a very clearly compliant way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, back to this, this idea of sort of affecting change um, that Julia touched on. So we, we have like a tagline at the business school here of change lives, change organizations, change the world. Um, and so, you know, naturally a lot of folks are thinking about, well, how do I use DAOs, right? To sort of affect change in the ways that, that you all were talking about. Um, and as a result, a lot of, a lot of the one-on-ones and, and questions that, that come to me and folks trying to get smarter about it is, you know, if I were to build a DAO, what, what does the zero to one process look like, right? Like, where do I even start? Um, and, and what are their, uh, let's call it the first three, three weeks to a couple of months, like, what are they going to look like for me, right? Um, so I'll, I'll sort of pose that question to you all, and I'd love to get your perspectives. Um, it's a big one. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll start with Scott and then go to, to Julia. So just to kind of reframe it, you're like kind of looking at, you know, what is the impact that DAOs can have like, you know, down the road versus today? Like we're talking more like long-term in this, in this context. That fair no, to say? I, I think it's maybe a two-part question, right? So like folks have aspirations to sort of have like large scale change and in, in whatever it is that their passion area or, or domain expertise is, right? I think maybe there's a question of is, um, a DAO model sort of fit for purpose for, for said passion. Um, and if it is like, what steps do I even take? Like people are just trying to wrap their head around all this, let alone understand the steps to take. Yeah, that's good. Cause I was going to go on, like, I mean, there's so many different like, um, ways to make impact and like, I, I wanted to make sure I frame that right. So I think that, you know, tangible steps to maybe get started is, is maybe the best way to think about that. Like if you have, you know, anything that involves capital or people like, DAOs again are just another structure by which to like start 
exploring those coordinated like ways to basically work together. If you look at like a company, what is a company? It's just a group of people coming together towards some common goal. It's just like we happen to have that as our default structure for everything we're doing in the world today. And I think that like that's just historical accident actually in a lot of cases. So in my view that, you know, really what, what do you need to get started? You need like a clear mission. You need something that you want to achieve. You need, you know, some amount of sort of structure around who's going to be in charge of what pieces of that operational flow. There is still contrary to popular belief, like there's a need to operate it out. You need to have like people who are in, you know, charge in a sense, they have leadership roles, whether that's within individual pods, as Julia might like sort of call them, or individual work streams um, in the DAO. But you also need like capital and you need to have like a treasury and managing that is its own process, often kind of done through its own work stream or its own um, sort of flow um, in, a, in a sort of like larger scale DAO like Uniswap. They have like an entire treasury management like team basically. And I think that, um, you know, when you get started, it's very easy because Literally, it's just a group chat and a multi-sig, and it's maybe five people. They're just getting together. And then as you scale, it's a question of, you know, using a lot of the same principles that I think you would learn to grow and scale a company or grow and scale a nonprofit. But at the center of that still needs to be the mission that you're really focused in on. You can't get away with sort of just like, you know, the reason Constitution now is going back to that example um, is probably doing so well. is because it's a very clear mission. It's very memeable. National Treasure wasn't a very good movie, but like they really like it's it's become a meme in the world. Um, Nicolas Cage is great, and so like that sort of thing just kind of creates yeah like a a, a nexus of like energy and like excitement. Um, and and to be honest, I think in a lot of ways that's like the same <laughs> the same like motivation right that um, we I have a hot take about the uh, about the movie here now. The uh, it, so bad it's good is a category of good movie, but. Um, the, I think the, the important piece is just, you know, don't totally throw away, you know, all the principles that you have for running a company. Um, I think you need to have clear guidelines about what you're trying to do, get people excited about it just in the same way as you would with any other organization. I think also this is probably like the biggest gap, um, in where like DAO idealism meets reality of like how we actually start DAOs. Um, it's kind of what I referenced in my intro is that um, unfortunately a lot of like the tooling and infrastructure isn't um, is still pretty new and nascent. So um, the actual on ramps to like starting a DAO and setting up all of the infrastructure needed is still really young and early. So I think when I sort of said your ability to affect change, um, I think as it stands today, you have a great amount amount of agency to affect change in DAOs that already exist. But I think in terms of spinning up DAOs, there's still like a good number of challenges and actually getting to that point. Um, I think it's still a pretty big undertaking um, that I think many DAO builders would probably agree with. Um, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes, but you know we are all working towards that goal that DAOs are these fluid ecosystems that um, we're able to spin up very quickly and, uh, you know, have that type of agency as a, as a group. I'd also say, like, make sure that what you're building requires a DAO. So I wouldn't almost think about what DAO should I build it to be. If you have an idea for changing the world, start with the idea and then think about the different mechanisms for building that up. Because as people have alluded to, right, the coordination can be a great benefit or a great burden associated with running a DAO. And and sometimes and like the kind of the two ways they're formed, it, maybe you start organically with a group of folks who eventually decide let's let's invest together or let's um, do any number of things together where we probably have some level of shared capital and messaging, or it can almost come top down where larger organizations, you may say maybe Uniswap, they were decided let's, let's decentralize governance um, and allow token holders to have more of a say and then form a DAO that way. So they can come about, but I would start from what is the purpose of this and is is the DAO in its current form the right tooling and platform for us? No, all, all, all really good points. I think uh, another question that I get and, and maybe another sort of way for people to get involved and dip their toes in DAOs is that you know, to your guys's point, there's so much that needs to be figured out, right? I mean, this is a new form of, of work and it's going to require not just 
a team of engineers, but um, you know, folks from a ton of disciplines coming coming in and um, figuring out what what DAOs are going to look like and how to evolve to get there, right? Um, so, you know, for for people that are either have like a sociology background or history or legal or you know business, any number of different backgrounds, um, if they were to want to pr to pursue research in DAOs, right, or or help sort of be a part of this push to advance um, DAOs with their expertise, how would you all recommend doing so, right? Like whether it be through a grant program or otherwise. Um, and I'll start with Derek. Yeah, I mean, at the simplest level, I think, again, if you think of DAOs as just large group projects formed around a common goal, um, these are essentially companies, right? you're going to have a lot of the same functions and like in terms of what a startup needs, um, aside from just development and, and engineering, right? You need things like strategy, growth, marketing. Um, for crypto, there's some specific ones like, like protocol risk, there's smart contract audits, there's like another other crypto specific ones. But I think there's lots of categories that regardless of your skill set, like are, are crucial roles um, and in terms of how to get started and, and sort of figure out what specifically applies to, to your background and your skill set I think looking at some of the exi like existing um, projects out there looking at the different roles that they are like paying people for um, and, and hiring for I think is, is one way to start and yeah, I think sort of if you want to actually implement it, going through grants programs um, that give out sort of RFPs um, and have a list of things that they're looking for is, is another way. Um, again, there's like lots of different categories of grants from like development work to research, to marketing, to education and Doing, doing one of those is a great way to, to learn and also just breaking break in and uh, sort of get some skin in the game for some of these protocols. I am um, just to double click there really quickly with you, Derek. I know, you know you and Larry are, are um, really involved in thinking through grants programs uh, and the like. I think maybe two part question. One is if people were to follow up on that advice that you just gave to sort of look at RFPs and roles, et cetera, um, I think the reality is we just spend a ton of time, all of us on Google and YouTube, like what Google search would they put in or YouTube search to land them in those places such that they can start to review things like that. I think part two of the question is for folks that are managing these grant programs, is there a, a set of criteria that they're looking at to evaluate whether to indeed sort of give someone a grant? Yeah, so work? I posted two of the, the grants programs. Um, there's a list of RFPs. Um, I would note that this is not like a, a an all encompassing list. It's just a, some examples of, of things that I think the protocol would pay for. But like these, pro like I would just I think the most important thing I'd mention is like these protocols have money. They have large treasuries. They want to spend it on and, and get contributors. So I think the the bottleneck is not. A lack of money it's a lack of people sort of aware that this even exists and like proactively applying it could be something completely unrelated to anything on on these rfp lists but if you're if you're if you're qualified and you bring something interesting you'll definitely get funding um i think the main yeah i mean the important thing is just like tie like when you're sort of applying to something like this tying it into how does it benefit the DAO sort of or the protocol in the long run, like how does it directly translate to growth down the line? I think like that and just, are you uniquely suited to, to somehow create that um, in, a, in a good manner and, and will you actually deliver? Which, yeah, so I think those are the most important attributes. I also think too, like you're toning with your questions, you're, you're really trying to get it like, okay, how do some of the people in this room get involved? Like what are the tangible next steps here? Um, and I think crypto generally uh, can be very scary to non-technical contributors. 
Um, but I would just encourage that there's so much opportunity and space for non-technical contributors. Um, and I would say like a tangible next step would be just start writing, like um, go into any Discord, pitch an article, go to one of the grants committees, pitch a research paper you wanna write for them. And I think that's a, a really great place to start. Yeah, no, that's, that's just, exactly the heart of the question. Sorry. Yeah, Scott. Oh, no, no. Yeah, just very quickly. I think one thing to add to that is just, you know, you can just dive into any kind of Discord channel and sort of get a sense of there's this like OODA model, like observe, uh, orient, decide, act. And like, you just want to like go in, see what's happening, see what's interesting to you, get a sense of like what's going on. Because sometimes like these Discord channels can be massive or like other channels can be, you know, pretty overwhelming to start. But by spending a bit of time and just like sort of getting a sense of what's interesting to you, like people will be willing to like pull you in. And to Julia's point, like a lot of these roles, in fact, like the most important role, I think in any DAO is community. Like you need to be able to like kind of help rally people and help coordinate people um, or help coordinate capital, which like makes sense because those are the two things that like are like the principal sort of pieces of, of these, these groups. So um, just plus one to that. And I think, you know, don't feel like you have to dive in immediately. Feel like if you're just, you know, exploring, that's perfectly fine. And um, if you decide you want to ask someone to like be involved, usually they'll be quite responsive. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and Connor, obviously, you know, for the Dow Research Collective, this question is sort of core to the mission. I don't know if you want to expand on what um, some of what you posted in the chat. Yeah, I mean, something I've talked about before, maybe Derek and I chatted about it, was getting a website where we could aggregate uh, RFPs for DAOs because there are so many different places where they're stored. It would be great to do that, um, I think, for the community. But at the DAO Research Collective, I mean, it's it's still, and, and having worked with a lot of grants programs as well at a, a variety of different protocols, it's really open-ended. Everyone needs talent, and there are a lot of fly-by-night people who just show up and kind of want money. But if you're committed and you put forward a, a good proposal and you have like kind of some other work you can point to, you will definitely get the attention of those like today who are doing grants. Um, and so just be focused and produce something that's going to you know create value for the program. With the DAO Research Collective, we've been doing taking a lot of different approaches. Like we've actually uh, approached people who've written things already to retroactively give them a grant for their work. And then they're part of our network and we'll help support their, their next works, but we're ensuring that they're continuing to write on those on those like parts of DAO operations, which we think are going to be really important. And then we also take in inbound. So sometimes with people who haven't written about, about DAOs previously. So if you put yourself out there and you, you know, we work hard enough and you even have like a small contribution to make, you'll find a place to at least get started. Great. Um, a ton of great questions. Maybe maybe we could just do one or two more sort of facilitated and then we'll jump to a, to a set of audience questions. Um, I'll throw the order of the audience questions in the chat, uh, just a FYI to everyone. Um, yeah, so obviously, you know, Scott and, and, and Julia, you guys touched on coordination um, with DAOs and whether it's using tools or sort of just having some like off-chain kind of organizational process that enables it uh, more effectively um, is definitely a challenge that I I, I hear a lot about in DAO. So uh, I'd be you know, curious if you guys could just expand on that challenge and how you guys think about sort of uh, building more, more effective coordination frameworks, processes, et cetera. Yeah. I'll say pods. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. <laughs> um, I think I like to think of coordination and like decision-making in the spectrum. And I think, where it DAOs exist today is that we really only have like one mechanism for decision-making, which is token-weighted governance. Um, I think we've identified a number of flaws with that system and how um, you know, we need to introduce other mechanisms for decision-making. Um, and so that's like a big part of what I'm working with pods at Orca is how do we sort of facilitate um, and sort of push down decision-making to the community and give autonomy to contributors to um, you know, coordinate and make decisions um, that don't require a, sort of a token weighted vote. Um, but, you know, I think it's obviously the heart of DAOs and I would say, <laughs> thank you, Scott. Um, when we think about DAOs and sort of the definition of DAOs, like I really just see it as a coordination tool and a coordination mechanism. So 
Um, that's like the heart of what we're all working on here and how we can optimize coordination um, effectively. So I see pods as a big part of that future and how we can uh, facilitate other forms of coordination and decision making. So I actually do think like I I like I, I wasn't quite kidding. Like I actually think pods like are like the key thing here. And, and, and like that takes many forms. Like the point is that with any organization when you scale, you lose the ability to like obviously pay attention to everything that's going on. That's why companies have departments. That's why like governments have, well, everyone kind of calls them departments, I guess, or calls them the same sort of thing in web two. But I think in web three, like the way in which those things form can be much more granular and like. I think that's part of what that concept of pods represents. Like you have like a, you know, probably a squad that you like hang out with in like a group chat somewhere. Like that is like a department. Like that is like a group. Like you have like a sort of set of like people that you're like coordinating with. It might not be around like always the most important things, like, but like you're coordinating with them nonetheless. And like it's part of just like the tapestry of like your your life. And I think one of the interesting parts about web three is for like unbundling this notion that like hey, like you work for this thing and then you're like, which is, you know, there's some challenges about like the 24 seven like nature of crypto. But I think one of the things is that you're working kind of online with friends and like you're doing things that you care about. And like all of that makes it feel like much more fluid and creates, you know, a need for these much more sort of fluid structures around which people are coordinating. So that's kind of what like to me pods represent. Um, I also think like similarly, there's a lot of tooling around like, how do you figure out what is important to work on to like form squads around like the RFPs are like one way to do this, but just to like pitch like, you know, Bitcoin grants is one other sort of like tooling piece here. What we've done with organizations like Uniswap is kind of created this mechanism called quadratic funding to signal what the community wants to see funded in the first place. So we have like 20 grantees donations come in from the community. That's like a skin in the way game to get signal. And then a broader matching pool is distributed to those projects based on that signal given from the community. And that to me is like a really good way to get a sense of, hey, like what do people want to see? And that can give you a sense of like, what do you actually want to form future squads around? Like what are these groups actually trying to accomplish? So I think it is all kind of coordination. Um, and there's just all these different contexts in which we need much more modular tools than we have before. Um, no, great. There are so many questions. I was going to ask one more, but you know, I'll hold it to the end. There are so many great questions coming in. Um, how about we just get the get the process started? Uh, Daniel, Kim, if you wanted to come off mute, um, you're welcome to, to ask the question, or you know, I can ask it for you if not. Well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll jump in and just ask the question, but ba basically Daniel asked, how important is it for decentralized organizations to have the visibility of a single figurehead? Um, are there limits to how successfully DAOs can run as sort of headless organizations? So kind of a question of, of what leadership looks like in, in, in DAOs. This is something I feel very passionately about is that I think in like the DAO idealism, we think of uh, DAOs as like these very flat egalitarian structures with no hierarchy or leaders, but um, it's definitely a poorly kept secret that there are a few individuals within DAO ecosystems that have a lot of power. Um, so I think um, that Daniel brings up a great point is that uh, visibility is a big part of that. And how do we create more visibility around the power systems that do exist in DAOs today? Um, who's working on DAOs, what are they working on, where do they sit in the organization. Um, and the more visibility we bring around that, I think the easier it is for contributors to understand where they can potentially fit um, in that system. I also think that uh, leadership is not necessarily a bad thing. Like Derek created the example of the group project. Um, literally in any group project that you do, like there is most likely a leader that will emerge from that. Um, it doesn't mean that they're doing the entire project. It just means that they're providing uh, like infrastructure for how we can all coordinate as people. Um, so yeah, Derek, why don't you go ahead? 
Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think, yeah, it's anyone that has like contributed to a DAO recognizes that some sort of people have different contribution levels, some sort of hierarchy is necessary or else like nothing happens. Um, I think the, the, the difference with like the DAO and other kinds of organizations is that it's easier to move sort of to, to move from like a completely new entrant to someone that has authority and, and, and can make a real impact. So I think that's the key to remember. Um, and when you're setting up pods to not have it be overly difficult to like remove people that are ineffective and, and, and there, need, there needs to be some element of um, social mobility that I think doesn't exist at many traditional companies, right? Like people dislike middle management. Um, like it's, you don't want that to, to develop in a, in a crypto protocol. Strongly agree. Yeah, I think that you need to have like a real sense of um, like what leadership looks like in a DAO is much more related to like kind of soft power, like who you can inspire, who you can like help like kind of understand the like vision and mission versus like just, you know, having like a boss who you like report to, who give you tasks, like it's not going to be that sort of like rigid. Um, and, you know, one of the results of that is that, yeah, there's a huge need to like figure out like, you know, how to manage those more fluid structures. All, all incredible points. Um, John Sue had a question about setting up DAOs and the challenges. Um, John, did you want to come off mute or I can expand on your question if not? Cool. I, um, I'll restate it. Um, he, so basically, John said, what do you think is the biggest challenge in setting up and running a DAO at the moment? I think we touched on a handful, right? Um, I think there are a whole set of others, for example, kind of legal considerations um, that you need to go through when you're thinking about structuring and, and setting up a DAO. But um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. Any other challenges that we haven't touched on when you're, when you're setting up a DAO? I mean, so many, like to, to sort of double tap slightly or double click slightly on that, like the, the, depending on the DAO, um, it's, it's very hard to get a clear answer from anyone in the legal structure piece. Like it's almost impossible to find a lawyer who isn't completely inundated, who knows anything about this. And if they do know something about this, they won't be able to clear, give you a clear answer. So this is, it's going to be, I think, a, a theme to a lot of the challenges associated with DAOs, but it's the uncertainty associated with running a DAO. Like you are truly doing something that's very novel and cutting edge and um, like the legal system and, and a number of other systems have not yet caught up. So you're, you're going to be um, without a lot of precedent or support sometime. And I think broadly, that's a big challenge of working in DAOs that many people find daunting. Yeah, I think the other big challenge really just comes down to, I mean, everything we've talked about with coordination is one big piece of this, but like maybe one piece we haven't touched on as much is like the, you know, well, we kind of touched on it a little bit, like the idea of offboarding people from DAOs, figuring out like Derek, you were mentioning, like, how do you know when someone's not a good fit? Like in a traditional organization, when you have a lot of hard power, it's easy to sort of just say like, oh, that didn't really work. Like, see, uh, like that's, I think it's more formal than that, obviously. But like the important piece is that you're able to, you know, use that structure in a way that like makes things much more efficient. Um, and you know, when you have these sort of more fluid structures, um, you really need to, um, it, it can be very difficult, like when you have a, you know, contributor that isn't doing what they were supposed to, or when, um, a, you know, project isn't like meeting the deadline that you set for it. And that sort of, you know, propagates if you're not careful throughout the DAO. So just being like very careful about like how you set in a company, the initial conditions matter, but like in a DAO, like the initial conditions matter, like even more because like um you just have like so much more that can go kind of like off the rails quickly and so one like that's why mission setting is so important and two like that's why having the right people sort of in those like leadership ish roles um in the in the context of DAOs is so important for sure 
For sure. And I, I think this is a, a good transition into the next question from Nina. So earlier we were talking about, you know, whether um, sort of DAOs enabling you to affect change and, and what challenges are fit for purpose to, for the DAO structure. I think some of you all said, you know, sometimes DAOs may, might not be re- the right structure. Um, so Nina's question was, what are some ideas or projects that aren't well suited um, for DAOs? I think where you need a lot of central coordination, um, like, I mean, I, you can even think of a lot of crypto projects where there's a lot of decisions that have to be made. And if you're looking at almost the extreme and inefficient DAOs, like a single token governance voting proposal system, you wouldn't want, for instance, people to be voting on like the UX on the company's website, you know, as an extreme example. To, to be able to build at times, you want a small, tight team where you're not taking a lot of time to make decisions. So maybe that, that team builds a project that ultimately decentralizes into a DAO, but at first instance, it would just be inefficient, likely to, to form it as a DAO. Yeah, makes sense. Um, any any sort of closing thoughts here? If not, we can uh, move on to the next question. We're more excited about the good use cases for DAOs. We're here to promote DAOs. <laughs> yeah, I was going to give some just silly examples of like, I mean, I don't know, like you wouldn't want like, you know, maybe nuclear codes controlled by like a DAO necessarily. Like you wouldn't want, like there's lots of things that are like, if it goes like DAOs, things will go inevitably wrong at some point and you will be able to course correct those things it's almost like in a company progress is like you know i mean even in a company progress is not linear but in a DAO, it's like much more sort of up and down it's much more volatile but like therefore moves faster i would say in some fashion and so um anything that where that volatility like will like you know create huge problems like in that case i think it's just you know probably not a good fit right now yeah without a doubt i have a ton of thoughts here most of which I'll withhold, but but I will say I think a lot about like decision rights is sort of a set of research and organizational psychology, and there are different models that lend towards sort of quicker decision making or what have you. And obviously, DAOs in their current form and current voting structures and the like um, don't lead to sort of quick conflict resolution or, or quick decision making. Um, to to some of the examples you brought up, Scott. Um, cool. So let's um, let's go to Phil with the next question. Hi, uh, uh, I want to, so I'm just curious about like the different voting systems and different voting structures um, for all these DAOs. Like the most common one is like tokens with like proposals and you can delegate your tokens or vote yourself. Um, I wonder if there's like different DAOs with different purposes that make, like I wonder if there's examples of other voting systems or other ways DAOs come, come to a conclusion or come to consensus. Yeah, I mean, the, I think the simplest, um, I think, yeah, you're right. Like the most widely used right now is just simple token on-chain vote for, for everything. Um, this is pr- pretty inefficient and most decisions, you don't need to, to have every single token holder vote. It's impractical. Um, I don't know that I see many other examples of like new voting models, like Scott mentioned, um, this, you actually mentioned quadratic funding, not quadratic voting, but there, there's some other voting structures. I haven't personally like seen those uh, live myself, but I think what, what we are starting to see is just outsourced decision-making among smaller groups of, of people, right? Index Co-op is an interesting project. Um, they just released a roadmap where, again, they're, they're establishing like 10 to 15 different different working groups or pods, and they're letting them have a, they have a constrained set of decisions that they can make completely sort of autonomously. So not everything has to go back on chain. They can just make a constrained set of choices. So like the downside is, is limited. Um, and then, yeah, so it's, and then that's checked in after like three or six months. So I think the, the easiest one is just, uh, not ma- making sure that only the most essential and, and impactful decisions go on chain and letting uh, 
the decision-making process be more efficient for other things. I was gonna to add to that. Like, I think a big part of this question is just thinking about the decision-making that's happening on-chain versus off, off-chain. And realistically today, like a lot of decision-making is continuing to happen off-chain. So, you know, wherever you're communicating with those group of stakeholders that are making that decision, whether it be Discord, Telegram, like Google, Sheets, whatever, um, a lot of decision making is still happening there. And um, I would second what Derek said, and that I think we're starting to see um, decisions being pushed down into smaller working groups um, or pods of people and voting becoming more of like an approvals mechanism. Um, so similarly to, you know, uh, a group of developers working on code changes in GitHub, like you're a part of that decision-making and changes that happen to the code um, as it develops. Um, and then basically when it's actually ready to be merged into the code base, that goes up for approval and there's um, sort of an approval system that's, uh, you know, everyone has to sign off on it and say like, yes, I saw this, I approve it, it's good to go. So I think like we'll start to see a little bit more of that. And I think it's a slightly more realistic take of how um, governance is happening today. Yeah, definitely just plus one on the fact that like most of this stuff is even in real life, you know, like we think of voting as a last mile sort of thing. Like we vote every once in a while, like, but most of the decisions we make day to day are not like things that we're, we're voting on. It's just sort of a natural way of like kind of, you know, operating by consensus day to day where like if someone's really objecting to something and like you, you'll kind of like take, take that into consideration, but otherwise like you're kind of continuing on a set course and you have like the things that you're going to do. Uh, just naturally in like the course of the day. So I think um, the one thing I'll note is that there are a couple of, yeah, like interesting voting mechanisms. Like I think quadratic voting, obviously unbiased is like very interesting in terms of just like trying to like give more power from token holders, like, you know, um, that may not be otherwise, like the problem with token voting generally is just like plutocracy, right? Like you run into this problem where like, if you have more tokens, you have more votes. Quadratic funding and quadratic voting are just ways to kind of like ensure that, you know, a larger percentage of the population of any token community is able to like make decisions and have like a meaningful impact. But there's another way to do that beyond just quadratic voting, which is uh, commitment or like conviction voting. And that's just kind of like the same mechanism or idea of staking, where like you're kind of taking tokens, putting them into lock for a period of time. The longer you lock them up for, the sort of more you're signaling your support and your interest in like this particular idea. So those sorts of models, like one of the beautiful parts about this ecosystem is that like, imagine trying to get like a legislature to like implement those policies and like those like voting systems as like just even a test, like it would take forever. But in this sort of system, like because it's just kind of permissionless and happens so fluidly, you can just implement these into a DAO, right? You could literally run a DAO with that as the entire goal to like run this experiment uh, with whatever voting system you have in mind. And like that to me is um, really cool because we're gonna get all these results of like how these different types of systems perform. So that's, yeah, just like one, one note, highly recommend looking into quadratic voting though. Yeah, as a, as a quick plug, I remember, um... You know, Connor helped set up the the uh, Dow Dow Summit. Um, if you just type in Dow Summit on on YouTube, I think I've watched it like three times, and it's three hours long. So like that's how good it is. Um, but in there, um, Jonathan Doten, who is a fellow at the Center for Blockchain Research here, um, talked a, a little bit about voting um, and thinks about that. If folks here wanted to to reach out to him, um, cool to move along. So we have about eight more minutes and three more questions. So um, maybe if we could like roughly keep it at two to three minutes for, for the remaining questions. Um, Arun, you're next up if, um, if you're still around and wanted to unmute. If not, I yeah. will, oh, go for it. Yeah, so um, this is kind of just sort of a quick one. Um, so do you guys see any issues from regulatory bodies undermining DAO structures and stifling innovation here? Because DAOs can touch on a wide variety of different types of businesses and do you see anything coming down the pipeline that could affect um, what y'all are working on? Yeah, the yeah, thousand percent. Um, so that's sort of a theme in blockchain generally, 
the governments have become very active in, in regulating and sometimes sort of for the better, but generally speaking, it's typically coming from the place of not being very educated on the technology or, and what its capability is. So um, I'd highly recommend if you're interested in this, check out like Coin Center, the Blockchain Association, Electronic Frontier Foundation, Fight for the Future, all great organizations working in the space. And it's a very important fight to educate policymakers and regulators so they don't just go ahead and, and make things illegal or make developers criminals or anything along those lines. And uh, Scott, actually, Scott and Gitcoin, um, and, I'm, and I'm helping Scott in this, are organizing a, a round specific to advocacy organizations because uh, they, they really need our support right now. So I'm sure there'll be more on that announced soon, but um, yeah, that's a huge issue. So a good one to flag. I would say 100%, and I think it's so important that we're educating policymakers and making an effort there, but this might be a hot take. I sort of think like, if like the crypto community weren't brave enough to build outside and sort of like on the fringes of legal structures, we wouldn't have DeFi today. So um, I think like a reason a lot of that exper experimentation was able to happen um, in DeFi was because like we were outside of these traditional legal frameworks. So I'm sort of hopeful that we can have like similar amounts of experimentation and innovation before we are beholden to certain requirements um, and that hardens in whatever way it does. For sure. Um, William, you're, you're up next. Yeah, thank you so much. I think my question got answered. I just wanna uh, quickly throw a very open question to everyone here is, uh, I think a lot of the, the framework we're thinking is you know, on top of democracy or uh, direct or representative. Is there anything from the political science academia space that you think is interesting that didn't really work out in the real world but might be really interesting, you know, uh, could be could, could be uh, very interesting in the in the DAO or the crypto world. Thank you. I actually think the easiest, like the lowest hanging fruit answer here is like liquid democracy. Like that idea is like kind of absurd in real life, but like it's literally how like most of the union comp style like governance systems that we use work. So if you delegate to someone in the Gitcoin DAO or in you know um, ENS, just uh, which is the Ethereum name service, just launched it out as well you can basically re-delegate to anyone else at any time, including yourself. So if for some reason, you just don't feel like the representatives are doing what you thought they would, um, you can just kind of switch that in an instant. And to me, that's something that would just be so difficult to do in the real world. Um, cool, and to, uh, to bring us home, uh, Vasu, if you wanted to come off mute. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think my question is in DAO accountability. Like, what are the best ways to ensure accountability in DAOs? Say, funds are actually used for the mission that they are sort of proposing. And how do you see this kind of governance framework uh, developing in the future? Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I hate to be a broken record, but this is like a big part of what we're working on with Orca is um, introducing sort of accountability mechanisms. So with pods, you actually have the ability to like hold people to certain rules and requirements. Um, and so, you know, we kind of make the comparison, like if you squint at the legal system as it exists today, it's just groups of stakeholders that are uh, beholden to certain agreements that they've made with each other. And a lawyer's job is to hold them accountable to um, those agreements that they've made. And so that's a big part of like what we're working on with Orca is like, how do we actually implement those sort of requirements that people are beholden to um, and actually hold people accountable and make sure that they're um, in line with that. And if not, then, you know, permissions and access to certain funds and such can be revoked. Um, I see it as a big problem in DAO ecosystems today and a big reason why, um, you know, they're not expanding outwards as much as we want to see because uh, there's really no like accountability systems to make sure we're in, empowering trusted individuals um so yeah um great if there are no more thoughts there um i'll just close with you know this was an absolutely incredible discussion i mean there's there's so much to dig into we could probably chat for hours and hours and hours um 
just as, as we close out in, in the next minute or so, if there are any closing thoughts or where people can reach out, um, I'll just give you all the floor uh, for that. For us, you can reach out sorry, I'll, I'll, at dowcollective.xyz. So I'll just share the, the thing here. Um, or you find me on Twitter, C underscore spell C. Uh, yeah, and we'd love to hear from folks who are interested in governments, treasury management, any number of different DAO things. Awesome. On my side, um, actually, one thing that I would note is if you're interested in learning more about like kind of the philosophy of DAOs and stuff, there's this program, Kernel Community, which is just launching a new cohort in the new year. So there's plenty of time to kind of get involved in that, and the applications are just opening. But if you just want to reach out uh, to me specifically, um, or want to sort of get a sense of the ecosystem more broadly um, in, in the Gitcoin sense. Um, not Scott Moore is my Twitter. I'll actually find the link in a second. Um, and then Gitcoin.co is sort of the main place. Um, you can find a bit more of the DAO stuff on gov.gitcoin.co. But feel free to ping me anytime. There's a lot to dive into here. So just like, you know, having people to help navigate like Connor's been doing. Um, I think it's really important. I shared my personal Twitter and you'll also see some of the, the proposals um, that we write on. We have one for DYDX right now. I would just say check out Worker Protocol, check us out on Twitter. And I would also encourage everyone to go check out the grants programs. There's a lot of amazing opportunities there and very tangible ways to get involved. Um, yeah, thank you for organizing this for me. I really appreciate it. No, for sure. And thank you guys again. We're, we're going to be putting this video up on um, on, on YouTube and, and typically people follow up with us and, with questions. So um, I'll let you know. Anyway, I look forward to, to continue, continuing the discussion with all of you. Uh, and thanks again for taking the time out. Bye, everybody. Thanks, all. thanks a lot, Tony. Thanks so much. Bye.